I'm Nathan and welcome to Stories with a Twang. This week's episode is called We Always Burn Liars Here by Vera Stahl. This is a Halloween story, but better late than never. Jackie was a werewolf. Pete was a vampire, though he kept referring to himself as a Dracula just to piss me off. And I was a witch, though admittedly the outfit was just a half-ass modification of my initial idea of girl Gandalf after my older brother Kevin set fire to my beard the week before. We were too old for trick-or-treating, or as Pete liked to call it, trick-or-treating, and we knew it, but that was part of the point. After a five-year hiatus on free candy because Halloween was for babies, we'd come back around to the idea that so long as we leaned into it being a prank, game, social experiment instead of just teenagers begging for candy that we could just drive to the store and buy, it was cool again. The idea was this. We would drive up to every house, not hiding the fact that we were old enough to do so. Pete and I were seniors, and Jackie was home from her first year of college, and between his beard, her tits, and my height, no one was mistaking any of us for children. That being said, we had a rule that we had to dress up in legit costumes and couldn't act weird or assholey when we went up to get the candy. Just polite trick-or-treating, as to do anything else could affect the bet. Because this is where the game part came in. Before we got out of the car at each house, we would each bet whether or not that house would give us candy. The odds were always in favor of yes. Most people might get irritated at older teenagers coming for candy, but so long as we were polite about it, it was hard for them to get past their default position of honoring Halloween customs. So the scoring worked like this. If you bet that a house would give us candy, you got one point. If you bet that a house wouldn't give us candy and you were wrong, you lost one point. But if you bet a house wouldn't give us candy and you were right, that was worth five points, so long as you didn't do anything overtly rude or whatever to make sure things went your way. Sarcastic tone of voice was okay, so were fake accents. But you couldn't say or do anything that was really impolite or highlighted our age beyond our obvious appearance and ability to drive up in the first place. No, thanks dude, get back to the wife and kids now, or that kind of thing. In other words, reasonable lying was fine, so long as it was done courteously. When we were done for the night, whoever had the most points got to divide up all the candy, and best of all, they got to pick the first three things the other two ate. Didn't matter how gross or sketchy, they had to eat it if someone gave it to one of us during the night. Had to have steaks, after all. So far, Pete was somehow ahead. He was a good guesser, he always had been, and it was irritating. I was only two points behind, but it felt like we were running out of houses as we moved further and further out into the dark countryside. That had been part of our plan, to go out to places that had lights on but were mostly remote, as they'd be less likely to have as many trick-or-treaters. They'd also be less likely to have candy at all, but most of the houses with decorations and lights on gave up something, even if it was from their own private stash. Jackie was one point behind me. Though I still thought her strategy for the evening was dumb. She was voting no candy on every house based on the idea that five points when she was right would override the one point losses the rest of the time. I tried to point out that we were only stopping at houses that looked like decent candidates to begin with and that always voting the same wasn't really playing the game, but she wouldn't budge. And I hated to admit it, but her strategy hadn't totally sucked so far and one no-candy house would put her back in the lead. That's why I complained when she started turning onto the long driveway at the end of County Road 13. She snickered as she completed the turn and gave me a grin, her fur-covered face green and sinister in the meager light from the dashboard. It has jack-o'-lanterns out at the fence gate with burning candles in them. That counts as decorations and lights. Pete gave a groan. Fuck, Winnie, she's right. Jackie had started down a driveway that was paved but with thick hardwoods on both sides that obscured the way forward as the path curved to the right. Irritated, I shook my head. 
It's supposed to be decorations on the house, not a mile away at the road. This doesn't count, Jackie shrugged. Well, we'll see then. If the house is dark or has no decorations, then we'll turn around and leave. I'm not trying to cheat, but I'm not turning down a good prospect either. Sighing, I slumped back into my seat. Fine, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's not even a house back. Holy shit. That last had been from Pete, and I didn't have to ask what he meant. We had just rounded the last corner, and instead of more woods or an empty, overgrown field, there was a large, antebellum mansion with brick walls of dark gray and tall white columns that lined the front like long teeth. We saw most of this from the sweeping light of Jackie's headlights, but they weren't the only things lighting up the night. Behind the hulking shadow of the house, I could make out the shifting orange glow of a fire. And up on the porch, there were four more jack-o'-lanterns to match the ones out on the road. Jackie turned and gave me a satisfied smile as she pointed first to the glow of the firelight behind the house. Light, and then the pumpkins on the porch, and decorations. I sniffed. I mean, technically, yeah, but does this place look like somewhere we want stuff from? It's dark and creepy. They probably have a bucket of razor blade candy in there. Pete laughed. It's Halloween. This is the kind of house we should be visiting. And isn't the razor blade thing kind of more of an urban legend? Jackie shook her head. No, that happened to my cousin once. But it's okay, because I confidently bet we will get no candy here. I rolled my eyes. What a shocker. Bold strategy there. She squinted at me. If you're scared, just say you're scared. I floated my middle finger around in front of her as I did a wavering ghost voice. Fuck you! Just don't come crying to me when I give you a poison candy bar covered in rat turds to eat. Snorting, Jackie turned off the car and got out. Come on, sore losers! It's Jackie's time to shine! I bet no candy, too. I couldn't see her face as we approached the house, but I could still hear Jackie smirking. Decided to back a winner, huh? Smart play. Won't help you out in the end, but I respect you for acknowledging my awesomeness. Ugh, whatever. Pete, what's your bet? Hmm, candy. These people have to be loaded, right? If they're even. The porch light came on as we started up the steps, home, and then under my breath. Fuck. Pete was already on the porch, grinning back down at us. Always bet on the Dracula. Turning, he walked over and rang the ornate doorbell next to the equally intricately carved black door. Far away, we heard a small bell chime. This was a weird house. Everything about this felt weird. Why couldn't they see that? I was just about to suggest we give up the game and declare Pete the winner when the door's lock clicked and it swung open. On the other side, a dead woman stood smiling at us. Pete must have been right. Whoever these people were, they had to be kinda loaded because her costume was movie quality. Not because it was over the top or really elaborate, because it was so subtle. The blue dress she wore was faded and curled at the edges with what could have been age or rot, and her skin had a faint blue tinge that stood out in the porch's overhead light, but wasn't cartoonish or overdone. The only other sign that she wasn't just an attractive middle-aged soccer mom was her left ear. Her long, dull brown hair was artfully pulled over her ear on that side, revealing a gnawed stub instead of whole flesh. Damn, you look awesome! Pete was right! Though it was hard to tell from his lingering gaze on her breasts if he was talking more about her zombie outfit or her generally being kind of hot. Jackie apparently thought it was the latter as she nudged him in the ribs and stepped forward, holding out her open briefcase. Trick or treat! Aroo! I stifled a sudden nervous laugh. The briefcase thing. Jackie had brought a briefcase instead of a normal trick-or-treating bag. At first, me and Pete hadn't understood why, but once we saw how she was betting against candy every time, it made more sense. She thought using something that wasn't Halloween-y or immature would tilt the scales towards pissing someone off so they didn't give us anything. I couldn't say for sure it had worked, but at the two houses that had told us we were too old, they both looked at the damn thing. Still, it didn't seem to matter to this lady. She just gave a soft laugh as she looked at each of us in turn. Well, well, I appreciate the compliment, and I accept the commencement of bargaining as well. Still chuckling, she took a step back. I have all manner of treats in the kitchen and will brook no tricks on this holy night. All I ask is that you tell me what you are before you pass my door. 
She gestured back down the hallway to a kitchen that was dancing with yellow candlelight. I shot Pete a concerned look. Ma'am, we don't normally go into people's houses. She nodded. I understand, but I just finished cooking and I'm afraid I have too large a variety to bring it out here. Shrugging, she started to close the door. But if you refuse the offered treats, we can close the- Pete stepped forward. No, no ma'am. We're happy to come in. He glared at me. Forgive my friend. She's just a sore loser. The woman smiled widely at him as she moved the hair behind her other perfect ear. So glad to hear it. Her face suddenly became more serious. Now, what are you? Pete hesitated a moment and then bared his plastic fangs. To be fair, they were expensive and looked good other than being a different shade than his actual teeth. I, madam, am a Dracula. I expected the woman to laugh or look angry, but instead she just nodded. Very well. You may enter our home. Pete stepped in as she turned to look at Jackie. And what are you? Jackie had lowered her briefcase again, and even through the tufts of fake brown hair glued to her cheeks and forehead, I could tell she was worried too. Still, she wouldn't quit playing so long as one of us kept going either. So giving another small howl, she stepped forward closer to the door. I'm a werewolf, ma'am. Very well. You may enter our home. The woman looked at me. And you? I started to speak, but something held me back. This, this woman wasn't right. I couldn't say what the problem was with her, and I didn't know enough to make the others leave, but there was a weight to everything the woman was saying and doing. As though this wasn't some kind of campy Halloween roleplay, but part of something real and serious. And she was still staring expectantly at me. Heart hammering, I stepped forward. I, um, I'm a girl dressed up as a witch. I was supposed to be female Gandalf, but my jerk brother burned my beard. The woman studied me for several moments before smiling again. Very well, you may enter our home. Closing the door behind me, the woman led us back to the kitchen. It was massive with double ovens, eight burners set into a large wooden island, and a long table along one end filled with a variety of cookies and candies and muffins and cakes, along with candied apples and pumpkin tarts and other dishes that I didn't recognize. Holy shit! Um, um, I mean, dang, you've got quite the spread in here. The woman chuckled. Thank you. We don't get many visitors out here and my boys have finicky diets, so I always wind up overdoing it. But it is Halloween after all. Please, take what you'd like. I felt a stab of panic and leaned into Jackie's ear. None of this stuff is wrapped up. Could have anything in it. We can't eat this stuff. Pulling back, she gave me a frown. How's that different than anything else? You think someone can't rewrap candy or inject something through a wrapper? And how often do you get to try fancy stuff like this? Pete leaned into the conversation. And don't think I didn't notice your whole I'm a girl dressed like a witch thing. You've lost. Give it up. Don't fuck up the best meal I've had in like ever. He grinned at our host. So, like, how much is it okay for us to take? It all looks so good. She beamed at him. As much as you want, of course. There are plates and bowls at the end, so feel free to sample here. And I can make you bags to take with you as well. As I said, I have far too much. The woman frowned as Pete reached towards some kind of potato fritter piled on a platter near the table's edge. Oh no! No, that's not for you. Pete pulled back his hand and looked at her questioningly. Oh, sorry? She waved her hand. Not at all. It's just that I prepare those with garlic and I wouldn't want you to get sick. Pete stared at her blankly for a moment and then let out a loud laugh. Oh shit. Right. Yeah. Um, I guess I have a selective diet. He picked up a small crystal glass containing what looked like dark layers topped with whipped cream. Is this okay for me, you think? The woman nodded. Yes, of course. Blood mousse with bits of caramelized baby fat for texture. She picked one up and handed it to Jackie. This should be good for you as well. Glancing between us, Jackie picked up a spoon. Sure, thanks. It looks delicious. The woman turned and patted my arm. All the food on the left side of the table is meat-free, my dear. I gave a slow nod. Well, I mean, I'm not a vegetarian, but the cookies and muffins look great. I pointed towards Pete as he was eating the first bite of his mousse. But those don't really have some kind of meat and... 
Pete spat a dark wad onto the floor as he began to retch. Lady, what, what the fuck is in that? When he looked up, he didn't look at her but me, his eyes watery and fearful. She frowned. Just as I said, congealed blood, quite a favorite of your kind. He was hardly listening, hawking and spitting as he tried to get the taste out of his mouth without trusting any of the various liquids on offer as a way to clean his palate. On his fourth spit, one of his fangs flew out and landed in the middle of the plate filled with bat sugar cookies. What is that? The woman's tone was icy. Look at me. Show me your mouth. Pete stared at her, slack-jawed, his lone fang still dangling there. What the fuck are you talking about? The woman's expression darkened as she turned to Jackie, who had set her own moose back down. And what about you? The treat not to your liking? Ma'am, this isn't funny. We're just going to go. Ah, let me go! Our host had grabbed Jackie's arm, gripping it hard as she pulled her closer. You answer me now. Are you truly a werewolf? Stepping forward, I tried to shove her away from Jackie, but she didn't budge or even look my way as she held my friend tight. Jackie was crying a little now as she shook her head. Of course not! It's a fucking costume! It's not even a good one and werewolves aren't real, you crazy bitch! Let me go! The woman did as she was asked, after a fashion, slinging Jackie in Pete's direction and sending them both careening into a nearby wall before tumbling to the floor. I moved to help them, but the woman was in my path. And you, are you a girl dressed as a witch? I could barely breathe as I squeaked out my words. Why, why are you doing this? Answer me, now. Yes, yes, I'm a girl dressed as a witch. She nodded, giving me a satisfied smile. Very well. You have maintained the covenant that your companions have broken. You may pick any treat you like from the banquet table. We just, just want to go. Go? <laughs> They can't go. They've broken covenant on a holy night, no less. There will be no falsehoods in this house or in my family's bargaining. Her eyes went to Jackie and Pete even as shadowy figures began to approach between the flickers of candlelight. One looked like a dragon, another a twisted skeleton, while the third was a ropey mass thick with clawed tentacles. The woman looked at them lovingly before giving me a warm glance. My boys. The glow behind the house had been a large autumn bonfire stacked high with wood and mounds of colored leaves that somehow never fully burned. More long timbers of wood lay to one side and it was to two of these that the monsters bound Pete and Jackie as they thrashed and screamed. I think I could have left before then but I couldn't abandon my friends even if the woman wouldn't let me intervene to save them. I did try once, but after that, her firm but gentle grip bore down on me heavily enough that I knew there was little I could do but shake and cry and tell them I was sorry. This seemed to trouble the woman somewhat, and as her monstrous offspring finished lashing my friends down, she spoke to me again. I hope this doesn't seem cruel to you. My family passed through the Imago some time ago, but we are still old-fashioned. We keep to the ways of Bargain and Palaver, and we especially revere Halloween, as it's one of the few times the world drops some of its pretenses. I had no idea what she was talking about, but maybe if I talked to her, I could convince her to let us all go. Pretenses? She nodded. That the world is safe that monsters aren't real, and that the truth that lay in the dark can't hurt you. Despite my plan to calm down, I could hear the angry panic in my voice. We were just wearing fucking costumes! That's what Halloween is about! Why are you punishing us for it? She frowned. Not you, just them. You were honest, and lying is certainly not what Halloween is about. That's just what fearful people have told themselves and taught their children. Another lie. Her lip curled, the gums around her teeth dark and withered in the bonfire light. And we always burn liars here. I turned as I heard a fresh set of screams. The horrors at the bonfire had picked up the timbers Pete and Jackie were tied to effortlessly, swinging them up into the dark October sky before pitching them down into the roaring heat of the flames. I let out one last scream, letting my painful cry fill the void left by the fading of their dying breaths. I squeezed tight, I slumped to the ground, wanting darkness to take me, begging to wake up and realize this was all some terrible nightmare. I felt something shift, 
both in my head and in the world around me, and when I opened my eyes, the night had turned to day. The remnants of the bonfire were still there, but no sign of any bones or bodies, and when I turned around, I saw the house was gone as well. Instead, it was just a large clearing, empty except for the large pile of smoldering wood, and next to me, a large pumpkin jack-o'-lantern painted black and made of some kind of red-fired earth. Choking back a fresh sob, I reached over and pulled off the stem lid and looked down inside. It was halfway filled with candy corn and chocolates, and resting on top of the sweets was a small note on orange paper. Pulling it out, I read what was written there. Don't forget your treats. Happy Halloween. All right, everyone, that's it for this week's story. I would like to give a giant thank you to this week's author, Veristal, for an amazing story. I would also like to give a giant thank you to Elizabeth is Afraid for lending their voice to this episode. If you have any stories you would like me to read on the show, you can send them over to storieswithatwang at gmail.com. The show is on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Stories with a Twang Podcast. It would mean an awful lot if you could rate and review the show wherever you listen, and don't forget to share with your friends and family as well. It could really help the show grow. I hope you all have a wonderful week, and until next time, remember that a little twang goes a long way.